Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, Da Vinci, Pianos and the Met. A new documentary reopens debate over Salvatore Mundi's authenticity. Then, one of Italy's most famous piano makers says his craft may be a dying one. Met is overcompensating with two galas after 2020 cancellation. Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi is the most expensive piece of art ever sold at auction. And now a new documentary casts fresh doubts over the controversy over its authenticity. Zeynep Gökçe has more. The Saviour for Sale by filmmaker Antoine Witkin sets out to tell the strange and chaotic journey of the Salvatore Mundi, a painting of Jesus Christ that's generally attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. The film starts at the 2017 Christie's auction where it was sold for a record price of $450 million, but whether it was worth it or not has been debated ever since. Normally, you wouldn't expect to see such a painting in a contemporary art sale, but according to Nicolas Joly, the former vice president of Sotheby's France, this was a perfect strategy to attract buyers who would want to land a piece by a big name, and who are probably not knowledgeable enough about ancient art. But Christie seemed to have faith in its bidders. They came from all over the world and they were all collectors that uh, you know are you know understand art very well that we know very well and that understood that this was a moment a once in a life chance opportunity the film suggests that this perception about the painting might be a result of the auction house's successful marketing campaign they promoted it as the last da vinci it was all over the news and was tempting enough for people from all backgrounds to run to the exhibition space to get a glimpse of it. But if it's not a da Vinci, why was it presented that way? To understand that, we would have to go back to 2005. That's when a consortium of art dealers bought the painting at a regional auction in the US state of Louisiana for less than $10,000. During the restoration process of the heavily overpainted piece, they came to believe that it was actually a long-missing Da Vinci original. But buyers weren't convinced. That's until London's National Gallery had its blockbuster Da Vinci show in 2011. The museum agreed to display the work after consulting a team of art historians about whether it was legit. Behind me is Leonardo's newly rediscovered painting of the Salvatore Mundi. It's just turned up and this is the very first time that the public will have a chance to assess this attribution which scholars have agreed upon but now is the time for us all to decide is this really by Leonardo. But according to the documentary only one of these scholars were actually convinced about its authenticity and that was Martin Kemp, one of the world's leading authorities on the life and work of the Italian painter. Now, this is where things speed up a bit. In 2013, Yves Bouvier, the art advisor of Russian oligarch Dmitry Rubalovlev, bought the painting for about $80 million in a private transaction brokered by Sotheby's. And in less than 24 hours, Bouvier sold it to Rubalovlev for around $120 million. The Russian wasn't happy when he realized he was probably ripped off after reading a New York Times article that reported the Sotheby's sale. Rybalovlev got in touch with Christie's in 2017, and finally it was sold to its current owner, the barely known Prince Badr of Saudi Arabia. But according to reports, he was a stand-in bidder for the kingdom's crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. The piece was also meant to show up at the 2017 opening of the Louvre Abu Dhabi. What's most important is that it's coming to the Louvre Abu Dhabi. You know, there's a lot of controversy out there, but that has nothing to do with the fact that it is going to be displayed 
at the Louvre Abu Dhabi, inshallah, very soon. But it wasn't. It also didn't make it to the blockbuster Da Vinci show at the Louvre Paris in 2019. In the Saviour for Sale, senior officials from the former French government anonymously confirm that the museum's scientific analysis of the piece shows that while it was produced in Da Vinci's workshop, the master himself only contributed to the painting. According to the film, that's why the Louvre refused to fulfill Prince Salman's request of having the Salvatore Mundi displayed right by the Mona Lisa. And because he didn't want it to be presented in any other way, the deal was off. Although the mystery about the painting's authenticity has been partly explained by the documentary, its whereabouts are still unknown, and the questions about whether its sale was a scam or just good marketing can't be fully answered. It seems like this Da Vinci code will be pretty hard to crack. The piano was invented in Italy at the end of the 17th century. But the coronavirus pandemic poses a threat to the future of some craftspeople in the Mediterranean country. Here's one of them. Luigi Borgato was 23 when he decided to make a piano for himself. In the following years, the Italian craftsman turned his business into a prestigious brand and attracted buyers from around the world. Borgato recently created the Grand Prix 333, the longest concert piano in the world. And famous pianists such as Vladimir Ashkenazi and Jerome Rose have given recitals on his handcrafted instruments. Now, however, the 58-year-old piano maker and his wife feel that their profession in Italy will not last past the coronavirus pandemic, that is, without a little government aid. What is the difference between us and other countries? That other countries, such as Germany and United States, gave important compensations during COVID lockdowns. Because when you close or decide that an activity has to remain closed for over a year, you should have to support it. Borgato and his wife Paola built two pianos a year with only one assistant helping them. Each piano took about 2,000 hours to make, and prices range between $300,000 and $600,000 depending on the model. Buyers are mostly from abroad and are usually musicians, but some invest in the instrument as a work of art. And Borgato says that his brand is the best quality compared to the whole country and even the world. Today, we need fast decisions, and it's necessary to support people in the arts. Many small piano factories across Europe have gradually disappeared and have been sold off to larger companies such as Yamaha. But Borgato doesn't want to give up. He hopes that with a little help, he can keep his livelihood and Italy's tradition going strong well past the pandemic. As vaccination efforts grow around the world, art institutions are relaxing lockdown rules. The Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York is one of them, and it's announced one of the biggest fashion events of the year. New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art throws a big invite-only party and exhibition every year. The gala also serves as a fundraising for the costume institution. That's how Met is able to finance most of its exhibitions and other acquisitions. The 2020 edition was cancelled due to the coronavirus pandemic, but the colourful gala is coming back. The museum has announced that they're getting ready not just for one night, but two. 
The first edition will be held on September 13th, with the second being in May of next year. Part 1 is called In America, A Lexicon of Fashion, followed by Part 2, titled In America, An Anthology of Fashion. While exploring the American fashion as far back as the 17th century, the theme will also have a contemporary touch, where it looks at 2020 and its political and social events. In an announcement, the Institute's curator Andrew Bolton talked about how the pandemic has caused wardrobe choices to become more emotional than practical. As for the pandemic restrictions, the museum will follow government guidelines and will announce more detailed rules later in the year. But for now, you might want to start guessing just how bizarre celebrities will try to dress up. The Marvel Universe is invading Disneyland. The California theme park is getting a new Avengers-themed area that includes a Spider-Man ride. Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream has been produced in many mediums. The latest is a 50-minute virtual performance that's generated with gaming technology. Nursen Altutar has more. The Royal Shakespeare Company has taken A Midsummer Night's Dream and turned it into what looks like a video game. The online adaptation is called Dream and it uses the latest gaming technology, mixed with pre-recorded animation. Everything in the show um, has the DNA of the play running through it. So we've taken all of the imagery of the trees and the flowers and the plants from the original play, and we've populated the Unreal um, Engine, the virtual forest, with all of those plants and trees and flowers. Um, we've taken characters from the play, we've taken some of the language from the play, and we've created a new story. Um, I think in, the, in the, the spirit that a radical playwright would approve of. All the acting happens with the aid of motion capture technology. Similar to the superhero films, Actors wear special costumes so that a computer can detect their movements and adapt them into the play. We're kind of puppeteering at times, we are performing at times. There's lots of different things that the technology is giving us that we have to be aware of. Um, so it's a way of, of telling the story to our audience but in a very, very different medium to the one that we would be used to as actors on stage and screen. A Midsummer Night's Dream is one of Shakespeare's most famous plays. It's set in a forest filled with fairies that intervene in people's lives and create problems. And the actors are excited to find new ways to perform the bard's magical world. 
I think he would love it. I think he would absolutely want to, to play with this. He built a theatre so that he could perform in the winter months, you know, when we couldn't perform in daylight at the Globe. A man that would go that far to build theatre to deal with the seasonal changes, I think he would be really excited to reach a wider audience. And also just to know that, that his work has lasted this long and it's things like this that keep it fresh, that keep people coming back, that help us engage with new audiences. Although the company is thrilled to play with new tools, the head of the literary department confesses that it was the pandemic that influenced the idea of a virtual play. So to reach people in lockdown and test the waters for this kind of performance art, the play can be viewed for free online. And maybe you'll find yourself exclaiming, oh, what visions have I seen, like in the play. Half a million tons of plastic waste from the Philippines pollutes the oceans each year. But now, some of it is ending up in the hands of this artist. These colourful paintings by Filipino artist Gilbert Angelis are just trash, but he likes it that way. Angelis uses a mix of shredded plastics, old paint and leftover wood to create his pieces. He's been working this way since 2019, ever since he became aware that his country has a serious waste problem. We are the third contributor of plastic waste into the ocean, the third worldwide. When I found out about that, I had to think of ways to raise awareness and spread knowledge about what is causing this. In addition to what he calls his post-consumer waste art, Angeles recently established a platform called Green Arts. He hopes the movement will influence artists to protect and conserve the environment through their work. Angelis says the goal is to find creative ways of reusing single-use plastic wastes that are already in circulation. But that's not it. We also collect expired, used and bad orders of paints from hardware stores. There are different ways in how we collect them, either from donations or we get them from demolished houses. We also get plywood and use it as a canvas. Angelis has made around two dozen of these kind of paintings so far, which have been featured in upscale galleries. Depending on the size, his pieces are sold for around $600 to $3,000. And the latest spot to display his trash art is this classy hotel in Manila. I love the fact that it gives us hope. This particular painting is called uh, Living Hope and that I find it really does give living hope. It's got beautiful colours, recycled plastic, repurposing bad things and making them beautiful things or not necessarily bad things but you know things that damage our environment. The efforts of Angelis is far from solving the huge waste problem of the Philippines. But as he once said, maybe a single work of art can help change one nation. Matthew Willey is on a mission to paint 50,000 bees on buildings around the world. It's part of an ambitious project called The Good of the Hive. It aims to highlight the fact that insects, which pollinate our flowers and give us honey, are being wiped out. Painting 50,000 bees all over the world is no simple task. But Matt Willey has made it his mission, a project he's called The Good of the Hive. Even though it is a healthy hive of bees that visually will be painted, um, it's really us I'm painting the human race into this collective hive. The project name was inspired by the bees' natural inclination to work as a collective rather than as individuals. Through it, the artist wants to encourage us all to connect with each other in a similar way while educating us about planetary health issues. It's about the fact that we're feeling alone in the process of going through it. The bee is not separate from her hive and neither are we. 
The idea sparked from a single chance encounter with a bee back in 2008. In my apartment, it just flew in and landed on the floor in the middle of the rug. And um, I got curious about her. She was walking across the floor instead of flying around at me. So I had no fear and I had no background in nature or bugs or anything, but I just got curious and I got down on the floor and hung out with this little bee for like two hours as she walked the last two inches of her life. And I noticed that there was a cuteness. I was like, I'm looking at a little tiny animal, not a bug as I understood it, you know? And I just really connected with this bee. Um, there was the fuzziness, the big eyes. There was just a personality there that I, I couldn't not see. Since then, over 6,000 bees have appeared around the world, everywhere from a barn roof in Nebraska to a school in the UK. The murals can take weeks at a time to create, but the process has already brought several communities together at a time when the bees' message is more pertinent than ever. All these amazing things happened. Somebody put me up in their RV for free for 10 weeks. People started giving me free salad bar, free food in restaurants. The coffee shop wouldn't let me pay for a cup of coffee. And the community was sort of coming together around this. I would turn around and there would be like an 18 year old girl with like tattoos and a nose ring talking to an 80 year old farmer and just agreeing and sort of looking at the bees. I was like, there's something energetically happening here that's cool. The target of 50,000 bees is high, but it's not random. It represents the number of bees in a healthy, thriving hive. While bees are the experts at working together, this artist is flying solo, and there's still a fair way to go. My goal has always been to be in every type of neighborhood in the world. I think I'm looking at, ideally in my mind, I'm looking at 15 more years. It's been more than a year since the first COVID-19 case emerged in Wuhan, China. The city went through some very tough times and things have gone back to almost normal. But one artist wants to keep alive the memory of what occurred at ground zero of a global pandemic. Yang Qian is working on her latest piece that features an aerial view of Wuhan under lockdown. Each black ink dot represents one of the city's residents. It's an expression of their unity in pulling through the crisis, as well as unseen pain. Kian wants to channel these memories of the pandemic into art and use them as a poignant reminder of what the people of Wuhan endured. It's the process that I want to record, to express what I've seen in a realistic way. This is the responsibility I've given myself. I also hope that much of this history will not be forgotten. During the first months of 2020, at the height of the city's coronavirus outbreak, she worked as a volunteer and helped deliver vital supplies to hospitals and residents. Kian's first post-pandemic artwork grew out of that experience. She says at the time, overworked hospital staff wouldn't answer questions related to new patients. Instead, they'd point out at the instructions taped on the reception window. For another piece, she was inspired by a photograph of a worker disinfecting a hospital hallway. The scene touched me because it will make people feel terrified and scared. Even in such severe situation, there are still people who stand up for us and protect us. So it touched me a lot when I saw this scene. Her efforts to commemorate this traumatic period also includes an exhibition that brought together 23 artists and their works related to the coronavirus. After the pandemic, she organized the exhibition Nirvana, which crystallized every touching moment of the pandemic in the form of artworks and conveyed it to not just the residents in Wuhan, but also people all over the world. I think this is very meaningful. But now the city has largely returned to normal 
People are still wearing face masks though, and that's probably the biggest reminder of the pandemic's impact. As for Kian, she wants to make up for the time she lost during the lockdown by painting, managing her gallery and preparing for upcoming exhibitions. She has no intention of leaving behind that painful period because for her, it was an eye-opening experience that made her realise how fragile, small and precious life is. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter account have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Ilf Bereketli, thanks for watching, bye for now.